Um, without further ado, I do want to give a very warm welcome to our audience and especially to our three distinguished speakers today. Today is a day that I have been looking forward to for a long time because we've really gathered um, three experts and three wonderful people to discuss some really important issues. My name is Dr. Christina Hook. I am the Executive Director of the Better Evidence Project here at the Carter School at George Mason University. Some of you are new to a Better Evidence Project event, and so um, a quick word about what we do here. So we work to bring together people from the policy, practice, donors, and research divides, asking questions of how we can move forward towards an evidence-based peacemaking that is informed by local peace builders and the best cutting edge social science data that's out there. So today we have uh, three people who've had very different careers that have all intersected with these important issues across the war prevention and mitigation space. Um, without further ado, I'd like to give a very warm welcome to the three of them today. Um, first up, we have Mr. Emmanuel Bambande. We're just delighted to have also one of our Better Evidence Project Advisory Board members with us today. Um, he is a United Nations Senior Mediation Advisor. In 2017, he served as Senior Mediation Advisor to the head of the UN Multidimensional Integrated Stabilization Mission in the Central African Republic. Prior to that, he was the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration of the Republic of Ghana. He's worked with the United Nations Office for West Africa and the Sahel, and he co-founded and was the Executive Director of the West Africa Network for Peacebuilding for over 10 years. He has been a lead mediator in many community-based mediation efforts in West Africa, and he serves, of course, on the Better Evidence Advisory Board. Uh, we also have joining him Ambassador Frederick Rick Barton. He is the co-director of the Scholars in the Nation Service Initiative and a lecturer at Princeton School of Public and International Affairs. He's an expert on conflict, post-war reconstruction and stabilization, and he serves on the board of the Alliance for Peacebuilding. Rick was the first Assistant Secretary of State for Conflict and Stabilization Operations and as well as the U.S. Ambassador to the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations in New York. He was a senior advisor at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, Deputy High Commissioner for Refugees at the UNHCR, and founding director of the USAID's Office of Transition Initiatives. We also have with us today Dr. George Lopez, who is the Reverend Theodore Hesburgh Professor Emeritus of Peace Studies at the University of Notre Dame's Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies. He is a leading expert on economic sanctions, peace building, and various peace related issues. Since 1992, he has advised the United Nations, international agencies, and governments on sanctions from assessing their humanitarian impact to designing targeted financial sanctions. He has written more than 40 articles and book chapters, as well as authored and edited six books on sanctions. He was also the senior Jennings Randolph Fellowship holder at USIP. He served on the UN panel of experts for monitoring and implementing the UN sanctions on North Korea. He was the vice president of the Academy for International Conflict Management and Peacebuilding. And I really could go on and on about these three speakers. I was teasing them a bit, but it's hard to cut down the backgrounds of the three speakers that we have today. So I'm very, very grateful that they've all and um, that we've planned in advance to have a conversation that goes a little bit beyond just the surface level talking points. We're going to structure it in the following way. We're going to spend about 30, 35 minutes with the three of them in conversation with each other. And then for the second part of the event, we do open it up to our audience for your participation and your direct dialogue with our speakers today. Um, at that time, we will begin to open the floor up for everyone who has uh, written your name in the chat as either having a question. It's our preference that you can ask your question directly to our speakers, but if you're not able to do so, please just text your chat, your, write your, your question into the chat, and I'll read it for you. Um, without further ado, let's get down to the business of today's session. Uh, I have a question that all three of our speakers are going to address. And it's really a personal question. 
I'm asking them um, with each of them working across and representing various high level international community institutions. We've got people who've worked with the United Nations, the US Department of State, USAID and the US Institute of Peace. Yet all of them have demonstrated their commitment to listening and learning from conflict affected local voices throughout their careers. With this key commonality, I welcome them to ask to answer. How do you describe the events, the experiences, and the insights that led you to believe that this was so important? Emmanuel, you are up first. Thank you so much, uh, Christina, and uh, greetings to all of you from Accra in Ghana. I recognize one of my former professors, uh, Lisa Sheik. Uh, it's a real privilege to, to have this conversation. First of all, I, I come to peace building practice see uh, happening around me and in the conversations and deeper level of listening, particularly with people who are affected by conflict. And one of this would be my experience in the Central uh, Africa Republic. Uh, many of you would know uh, this this huge landmass that occupies the middle belt of Africa uh, also experiences the most protracted conflicts in Africa and right from its uh, independence. Uh, it has experienced political instability and never had any peaceful transition of the transfer of power from one leader to the other. As you introduced me, I worked in uh, this country, most of the time in 2017 and part of 2018. When I arrived, what was remarkable, traveling in the jungles, in the lost vegetation of Central Africa Republic, was local-led initiatives with more women holding society together. And yet when you looked at the national context, that completely changed. And the preoccupation was leaving the spaces for political actors, particularly the leaders of the 14 armed groups and the government of CAR. And any effort at dialogue simply did not take into account or recognize the incredible work that was happening at the subnational or community level. And I would then add uh, here that in 2017, what happened was that the southeastern part of the country that was spared due to changing dynamics experienced one of the major attacks by the group called the Anti Balaka. The Anti Balaka basically was a grouping of Christian groups and animist groups as a backlash against what was perceived or considered to be the S Selika, pr predominantly Muslim groups from the north of the country. Now, in one of the uh, main towns called Bangasu, where most of the Muslim population live in the same neighborhood, the attack targeted them. And the interesting paradox was that most of them took refuge on the compound of the Catholic Church. And I was visiting Bangasu, and I saw at first hand the local level effort to try and build bridges between the two different communities. And for me, I thought that should have been the primary role of the UN mission based in that region. But I saw that they were more preoccupied with the day-to-day -day issues around the 100 military men and women who were sent to protect civilians. And yet the protection of civilians could not happen if you could not bring the type of confident two groups. And without only taking more time on this, what then happened was my uh, advocacy, sometimes with a lot of insistence, back in the capital, the head of the mission, the Secretary General Special Representative, uh, made the difference. Was the Cardinal Zapalanga and the Imam uh, Kobin, who passed on last year, 
the two of them started a local initiative for dialogue that built on to create Uh, related to allowing people to be able to go back to the market uh, for groups to disarm. And that was the entry for the UN to now be able to support this local initiative and provide a better uh, framework in terms of how it can be consolidated. And I then continue to argue about that local structure needed to be supported and needed to be uh, helped to cohesiveness. Uh, some and the build bridging that was so important. Now this marked me since then, and I have been increasing my advocacy for the support of sub-national and local level led peace initiatives. Yeah, thank you, Christina. Rick, I'd invite you to, to speak next. Hey, thanks, thanks, Christina. It's nice to have a, a former CSO colleague as our moderator here. And also to share this moment with George, who I've known a long time, and Emmanuel. Thank you, and great to see so many old friends. Uh, thanks to all. I, I think the key point that I really want to make, and then I'll give you a little bit of a background, is that the cardinal sin in most of the situations that I've been involved in, over 40 conflicts around the world, is not knowing the place and not knowing the people. Uh, that's the cardinal sin. And I think uh, as I did my book tour, I, used, I, I had a, a, a line, and it is a line, that if the United States does not know 100 people in a place, then we should not send a U.S. soldier. And if we had followed that simple rule, we probably would have avoided Vietnam, Afghanistan, and Iraq, which I think would have made a substantial uh, mark in our, in our nation's history, because those were obviously incredibly painful experiences um the reason the reason i got to this uh, uh um the approach that i've really favored uh the reasons are, are multiple first off i started in, in politics uh organizing at the local level in the state of maine and i found that to be really successful then i took an i took an mba course and i was really enchanted by the marketing professors and, and if you're doing excellent marketing you're generally listening to people you're trying to find out what they what they want and what they need rather than rather than well we're colgate palm olive and they're going to get another one of whatever we have uh, as an approach so that was a bias as well but then I, when i arrived in washington in 1994 it was the heyday for small conflicts uh, fundamentally, we had Haiti, Rwanda, Bosnia, a whole series of places that we did not know, partially because they were small. Um, I mean, the number of people in the State Department that could could talk about Rwanda knowledgeably before the, the genocide was probably, you know, maybe two dozen and people plus people had been there. So I discovered before I went out to Bosnia that I, I shopped the U.S. intelligence community. So I went to the DIA, I went to CIA, I got the briefings, and I was kind of surprised at how little we actually knew about these places and, and how little uh, we were investing in getting to know them. I was lucky at that time to run into Bob Gersoni, who had had just finished the project in Nicaragua, and I and I got to hear his his brief, his always inimitable briefs, which you, you have to listen for three or four hours, and he does not let you go to the bathroom, so you you really have to pay attention. Um, and he he described a, a model where he had talked to several hundred people on the on the Atlantic coast area of of Nicaragua. And what I loved about it was it was so replicable. It wasn't dependent on one expert or one in, one set of insights. If you, if anybody went out and talked to several hundred people, they would undoubtedly get very much the same points of emphasis. And rather than uh, approaching it the way maybe a UN experts team might do it. We have 45 experts going out to a country. And guess what? They all come back and say that what they do is needed. And they're not wrong. It's just that doing 45 things at the same time is really hard to be good at. And uh, so what, what the Gersoni model and really talking to local people is that you bring out the priority of priorities. And I think that that is really where we need to focus in these places, because you're trying to be catalytic. You're not trying to you're not trying to be uh, convert the world because that's just a big, big project. Um, and, and we've seen numerous religions fail at it. So why would it work for us? Um, so I, I think you've got to, I think 
those are all the biases that I bring to it. But I had a chance to really sort it, test it out in Sarajevo right away. And I had one big advantage. I knew virtually nothing about Bosnia when I got there, but I actually knew that as opposed to people who thought they had, because they'd worked in, in Belgrade or they'd worked in, in Zagreb, that they would know, they have all the answers about Sarajevo. And so by going around and talking to 200 people, I realized that very quickly I had brought an expertise and an insight that almost nobody else had, and that was very necessary, and it was extremely grounded. So that's, I hope that answers your question, Christina. It does, thank you. George, we turn to you. Well, thank you, Christina, and so great to be with these two fine colleagues and friends and see so many friends in, in the group here assembled uh, that you've put together today. You know, my path is, is considerably different in many ways because uh, even with marvelous stints at USIP and at the UN, most of my life has been in education. And uh, I think hugely formative for me was the advantage of uh, starting out as a 25-year-old wet behind the years PhD at Earlham College, a Quaker college, deeply committed to being in the world, and took me in summers and with students often uh, at other times to uh, conflict zones because, of course, American Friends Service Committee was working in those areas. And uh, learning quickly that the only thing I could really do in the crude language abilities I had and other things was to listen to locals and to watch, uh, in a sense, almost enviably, at the way my students uh, were continuing to use the wonderful Quaker technique of querying locals about their own views, their own experiences. And if you were gonna open your mouth, I concluded, it ought to be not to make an assertion uh, or certainly not to talk about yourself, it should be to find out as much as you can about your hosts or about the difficulties you've come to observe or observe, participate in and to make sure you were always critically self-reflective about that. And I was stunned how well that served me time after time as my own professional life could link the academic with the practitioner and find ways especially to learn over time, uh, for example, that there were starting to be techniques developed in our field like dialogue uh, and ways in which the notion of putting everyone in the room whether they were victim or perpetrator on a same kind of plane and search for reconciliation and search for the opportunities that might be available to extend very tentative uh, ending of violence to something be more institutionalized. It was so critical to have that diversity of opinions and to understand there were always gonna be diversity of opinions in the locale you were fortunate enough to be invited to or to be uh, playing some small role in. Uh, the second thing I think I've learned that was uh, a big impression on me over the years, and, and it's occurred more in the last two decades, I'd say, has been that unless you as the outsider recognize that peace only comes with some inventive coalition of the local and the larger, you're not going to be helpful in being part of that outsider. And that experience is something I've been able to bring back to the classroom, uh, being in the classroom again with many marvelous international students. And it's interesting to see how it resonates with their own experiences. Uh, I mean, we're not surprised to hear our uh, folks coming from their conflict locales, seeking greater training, saying, boy, let me share with you my terrible experience of the person who came from USAID, apologies, Neil Levine and others, uh, and uh, uh, various other locales, and, the, and they had the blueprint. Um, and, and we were saying, we've got some blueprint too, but the ink isn't even dry because that's how tentative it is. And you've got to mix your hand around in that before you tell us various things, is to see the, the combination of those experiences being shared, but also them having great stories of victories of the local in its own skin, in its own way of having forged alliances between the local and the larger global. And uh, at this stage, I think that's become most formative for me. So I've been fortunate to have formative stages at, at, at each phase of, of my life. And that's now what I continue to like to reflect in seminars with students or in, in groups like this. Well, I, you know, I was thinking about some of my early career experiences, all of this is jogged it, and I will say that maybe 
uh, in our speakers panel today that I go the, the farthest back with Rick, actually. And I remember meeting for the very first time about 10 years ago, my first uh, representative at the time of the Bureau of Conflict Stabilization Operations CSO at the State Department. I was just finishing a master's program. I had been introduced to one of our office directors, Rick Raphael Carland, from my professor at the time, which is recently retired Ambassador Chris Hill. And I met this representative of the State Department, which was very new experience for me. And he said, oh, what did you study? And I said, anthropology. And he said, oh, well, with CSO, always lead off with that. And so, you know, I, I began to learn that, that there were places within these big policy uh, institutions that were really interested with uh, this, this knowledge, this deep understanding of, of local successes, of local challenges, of how local people viewed their conflicts. Um, and I think that at the Better Evidence Project, I was just sharing with our speakers before we began, we're really interested interested in uh, moving that impulse into further institutional reform throughout all of the corners of work that we're doing in the peacemaking space. Uh, without further ado, I want to get into some of the specifics of the areas of expertise that we bring today. We entitled this Diplomacy, uh, Policy, Mediation, and I wanted to turn back to Emmanuel. We are so fortunate to have a deep expert in this topic of mediation and uh, really an expert on this topic, Emmanuel, from their inception throughout their completion and beyond. Um, and your career is also spanned, as we talked about, international practitioner training to service with the Republic of Ghana to your current multilingual work with the United Nations. And so as we dig into your expertise, what do you think are some of the best practices for advocating for locally led and locally supported conflict transformation within high level policy institutions? Thank you so much, uh, uh, Christina. If, if I take a step back, going to my days in EMU, and what later on would become the, found, the founding steps of the West African Network for Peace Building, spanning across the entire West Africa space today. What I'm reminded of is, it doesn't matter what shape or form we engage in mediation processes, how we end violence, it's about how we sustain peace and rebuild communities, rebuild society. And I remember together with a colleague, uh, when we were introduced to John Tima in Washington, at that time, the head of the Winston Foundation for World Peace, he looked at the two of us and he said, and at that time, we we're quite young. He says, you young two guys, something tells me I can trust you to do something significant in West Africa. I don't know what it is, but I'll give you a first grant and I'll follow it up with a second grant. That long story, to cut it short, is what today is the West African Network for Peace Building. I recall this to simply say that the challenge is we engage in efforts to end wars, to end violence, but we, we exit without the local capacity or infrastructure to sustain the peace. And so for me, I have come to uh, learn that whatever we do from outside the context and within the context, whether it's at the national level or the subnational level, alongside should be the thinking on what do we leave behind that is an institution or a local structure to sustain the peace. And very quickly, a lot of my work in, uh, during the lockdown has been in support in Burkina Faso towards what we generally call an infrastructure for peace, in which at the local level, jihadist groups and violent extremists, extremists come into a community, they exploit the fault lines of conflict that are prevailing. For example, between ethnic groups who are nomads versus ethnic groups who are farmers. And they then exploit this and gradually begin to recruit. And so why don't we have a structure in which these two communities find themselves represented and sitting on a day-to-day -day basis to talk about their own problems, own their own problems, and try to find their own answers to their own problems? Because the answer is always in their hand. And the more we do this, 
with support from the central government, the regions, and partners international, the more we can sustain what is possibly going to be peace. And my second point to conclude on this is that national governments and all of us should advocate for that. The UN system, regional organizations, civil society groups, women groups must form a mechanism of coordination of support. The peace building field is quickly changing in which mediation can no longer be anchored on that mediator who leads the entire process. The mediator must be very good at building the type of networks that supports the process. But how you do that, you sometimes need the political leverage. You sometimes need the type of support in the policy decisions that make it possible to have. I remember sitting in the office of the Minister for Social Cohesion and Decentralization in Burkina Faso. And together with his team, there was so much resistance about why I think local initiatives with local structures can be a response. And typically with the type of training we have, before I knew, I started sketching on my notebook before the minister. He was surprised I was making the sketches, but I wanted to make the point that if you don't link your national efforts to the bottom up, which is where the issues are, you are not able to achieve much. And so I have since suggested that the head of the UN in West Africa, national governments must, with partners, USAID, all the development partners, USIP, we must concentrate now on how we build structures at local and subnational levels to sustain the peace and not just to mediate, to end the conflict with an agreement in Khartoum for the Central African Republic, walk away and expect that we can sustain peace. And I'll be happy to elaborate further uh, later on. Thank you so much for that. I think that uh, you've given us so much to, to even begin to think about, Emmanuel. And I think one of the things that has been so valuable in your remarks is you've not only acknowledged some of the challenges of the context itself, as well as the bureaucratic challenges, but some ideas for moving beyond those challenges. And I think that uh, I'm going to continue that theme now with Rick. Uh, you know, you have been on the front lines of these conversations that have happened internally and that are often very sensitive within U.S. foreign policy circles about what was called uh, for a while expeditionary diplomacy, um, a loaded term in and of itself. And so that topic, though, meant that we were to move beyond embassy walls and capital cities. But there have been challenges there as well, including tragic events like in Benghazi that have profoundly shaped the logistical abilities of US personnel to increase their field presence to really begin to build the networks that Emmanuel has just reminded us are so important. And so um, can you speak more about the internal constraints that limit international engagement with local peace building, as well as how we might overcome some of these challenges? Sure can. Thanks, Christina. In fact, I'd like to write a book about it. Uh, but since I have three minutes, let me just focus on uh, sort of what I consider four or five constraints and then talk a little bit about Syria. Just look at the Syria case and how, how you might get around it, even in a place like that. Um, the first constraint that I've mentioned is risk management and, and the and tolerance. Um, we, these are really tough places. And we don't have that as a cultural, uh, it's not ingrained in the culture of a, of a place like the State Department. There's obviously, oftentimes when you hear people say safety first, you wonder why don't they just stay in Kentucky because it's not gonna be that kind of place if you're gonna work in Libya or wherever it happens to be. The second one I would say is just the culture of, 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 uh, of, of engaging with local people. That is not of being in a place and engaging with local people. We've really got to, we've really got to get back to that. The, the best practitioners do that. They, they, they become one with the place. They don't, uh, and that doesn't mean that they've got native. The third one I'd mentioned is just the habit of experience and, and doing what we usually do. I'm always stunned that people will arrive in a place and they say, oh, yes, this reminds me so much of Bosnia when, and, or it reminds me of the neighboring country. And sometimes, you know, when I was in the Congo, I feel much more like I was in Haiti, but where I was in Angola, I felt much more like I was in Serbia. Now, 
those are not natural uh, uh, relationships. And, and people who may be regional experts don't, don't get that broader uh, exposure either. Then I, the fourth thing I'd mention is, are we being honest with our assessments of the situation with ourselves? Because these are really uh, confounding places. Um, but then with the, with the public, with the people of the place, with the U.S. Congress, we tend to report that we've got things, we've got something quite promising working. And it's most of these, most of what we do is much more experimental. The advantage of an experiment as opposed to a precedent is that if an experiment fails, you can say that's what it was. But if it, everything it has to be a precedent, then you're kind of stuck with uh, the, the history of it going forward. So I, the final thing I would say is the conceit of the experts and the outsiders that oftentimes people arrive with a conceit of being more educated or more, more, uh, more something than the local people. And that could be true, but I don't know how you are with your car, but when I get to a mechanic, he's the genius, I'm not. Um, and I, I think that's an important, so humility becomes a, a, a critical driving point and the recognition that people must own the problem and we've got to figure out how to help them uh, catalyze a solution rather than being the solution. Now, Syria was a classic case of that. Um, so the, there was an explosion of new talent that almost nobody had really dealt with when the revolution started in Syria. Why? Because everybody who had any talent had either left the country, been killed, was still in jail, or was hiding. So all of these people show up for a revolution, and we don't know any of them. And that's and that. And, and furthermore, we like working in a centralized way. If you're the UN, you like to go in and meet with the, with the host government. Well, we do the same thing. The, so the, the natural decentral, and, and by the way, none of these people trusted each other. Why? Because if they did, they'd get end up in jail, killed, or having to flee the country. So, um, so our, our structures did not match the opportunity. And we then stumbled into, okay, how do we get these people who don't know each other and don't necessarily get along? How do we get them to pull together? I think in both Syria and in, and in Libya, a highly decentralized approach would have been by far the wisest, but it would have taken an extraordinary effort. And I can, I'm happy to, to talk as we get on, because I, I, I can see I've gone beyond my three minutes, uh, of some ways of doing that, even when you cannot travel freely in a place, which obviously you could not do in Syria and in, and in uh, Libya, but you can still meet local people in lots of different ways. And this is where technology and communications and, and the ability to, to trust others can be helpful when, when you can't get there yourself. So again, I hope that answers your question or gets started on it, Christina. Thank you, Rick. Um, and each of you are really queuing me up for the next question I'm going to ask because Rick, you've just mentioned about being honest with ourselves and experimenting. And that cues me up very nicely to now turn to our social science expert, George Lopez. Um, you are a leading expert on economic sanctions and on peace building, looking, as you said in your opening remarks, at these from an intensive many decade career on these topics throughout many different contexts. And um, I wanted to ask you, when you are looking at a specific policy intervention, we'll stick with sanctions, as I said, um, you're looking at questions, George, of will it work in a particular context? Will it not work? Being honest, as Rick said. And so when you're approaching a certain context from a policy intervention, how do you judge policy ripeness? And what gaps might exist to measure or monitor their effectiveness? Well, thank you. Christina, for that tough question, um, and welcome others to the schizophrenia of my life, of part of it being in peace building and part of it being in economic sanctions, uh, seeming, uh, unfortunately, now as diametrically increasingly uh, opposed. Uh, when I began in the economic sanctions enterprise uh, with the privileged position of looking over the shoulders of some folks in the Security Council in the 1990s, uh, yes, effectiveness was the uh, real mantra of the day and what it meant to uh, begin with, if you talk about social science, a relatively small amount of social science research and anything to do with not only how you measure effectiveness, but even how you design, formulate, implement, and monitor sanctions. All of that was uh, sort of designing the jet engine as you were on the runway. And particularly because those efforts were multilateral uh, it raised the question of not only ripeness, but of different national interests coming to bear, 
in what sanctions should be formulated, the conditions under which you impose sanctions in a civil war to try to, to, to end it, the conditions under which you could judge and be nimble when sanctions were not only ineffective, but having the exact opposite impact you intended, uh, not only with regard to a failed arms embargo, uh, actually increasing the prospects of violence, but also when what you increasingly called unintended consequences, which were humanitarian in nature, uh, had no mechanism by which to, uh, to remedy them. And uh, I was struck by each of my good colleagues' uh, various assessments because that notion of honesty, the notion of conceit on the part of the policymaker, unfortunately, I've watched that, especially in the last decade, I think in turning sanctions into a potential instrument that could be used as part of a wider strategy to separate warring parties or to respond quickly to a dictator increasing repression or to try to constrain uh, the use of terrorism, move from that to uh, delightfully for too many governments, a form of economic war in which you're not engaged in any kind of diplomacy. You're not engaged in any kind of assumption that you should be involved in an exchange with the other party. So you're clear about what you want the behavior to be that changes, as opposed to a type of sanctions, which simply says, if you could be eliminated, that would be better. That would be the desired policy outcome. Um, I, I was in a meeting last night at the Massachusetts Peace, Act, Peace Action Committee, about 80 people listening to a couple of speakers talk about the need to bring sanctions as a whole to an end. And I was not a speaker, I was intentionally just, just wanting to watch and listen. And the number of just very vilifying people who believe that uh, sanctions ought to be thrown out completely and we've gotta find some other way to communicate international norms, but not knowing where it is, what was both instructive and painful with regard to both being a social scientist and somebody on the policy end of this. I look at a Burma, you ask, what are the policy needs? With Burma, we need to find every single way as soon as possible to make the costs of this regime continuing to kill its citizens higher and higher and higher, and economic sanctions is a quick way to do it. If you want change in Venezuela, if you want change in Iran, sanctions have far outlived their utility, you better move to the peace building side. So I, I find myself in this particular uh, situation going back to, are we thinking honestly enough to talk to one another and to talk to the victims of our policy about where this might go? Or are we filled with the kind of conceit that simply says, I have the strongest tool in the toolbox and I'll determine where it goes when I'm ready. And I fear I'm hand, hearing and seeing in the last decade, the latter in ways that uh, we're lagging behind and challenging the way we should as peace builders. Thank you, George. I have to say that I very much appreciate all three of your honesty, all three of your personal reflection, all three of your willingness to really engage the challenges that make this work easy to say and hard to do. Um, I can also just mention as I look over the wonderful audience that we have today that um, if you look at the chat, we've already begun to, as I say, get another edited volume going in the chat. Um, we've got some wonderful dialogue going on. And so I want to give a heads up to our audience that it's nearly your turn to also ask your questions. I'm going to give one more question to our three speakers to talk about together. And then at that time, I'd like to um, take uh, myself out of the inquisitioner seat and turn that over to our audience members. So just to remind you if there are specific questions that you have for our speakers please begin to write either those questions or just indicate your um, desire to ask a question in the chat now and after we finish up this final group question we'll turn it over to you um, I have to say too that as we've also talked about personal experiences we are collectively uh, for all of us across the many different countries we have on the line the many different professional areas that we come from and varying levels of expertise, we are all of us facing a similar issue and that is the elephant in the room of a global pandemic. Uh, we are asking a lot of questions about what 
peace building, peacemaking, locally led initiatives are going to look like in the future. And so our three speakers have um, been been game to, to now address this difficult question of questions, I would say, the question everyone's asking and that no one exactly wants to be on the record for because a lot of us just don't know. Um, so they, they have come ready to talk about um, this issue that across policy, practices, research, and donor divides, we are all questioning what this means for our work. And now I'm gonna ask our, our speakers in the order that they first went, what changes are you anticipating? And more fundamentally, what suggestions do you have for our audience so that instead of just reacting to these changing circumstances, we can proactively shape peacemaking efforts instead of um, just reacting time and time again. Emmanuel, we'd like to begin with you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Christina. Uh, first of all, we have to accept that the environment has become more complex for peace processes and for peace efforts. And that if you take, for example, uh, the role of good officers, political missions, in which uh, discreetly, supported by good advice, academia, uh, envoys could engage bilaterally with key actors and hold them to be committed to certain outcomes that could lead to peace. That has suffered during the pandemic. And for me, the evidence is you look across West Africa and there was a commitment not to have presidents go for a third term beyond their permitted two terms in office. But take Cote d'Ivoire, take Guinea, all that has happened precisely because you could not engage bilaterally as you could uh, before the pandemic. The other aspect is that actors are more difficult to identify. If you look at the whole spread of extremism, terrorism, and political processes, therefore, are not as viable as we always anticipated in our design processes. It's against this background that the way we engage should change accordingly. I think we need more strong linkages of the type of international efforts that makes it possible for the type of prevention and preventive work to be able to uh, come to bear. But let's keep in mind that when we are confronted with some of the complexities that uh, I am talking about, what it means to be the voice of the voiceless sometimes will require that powerful nations of this world politically are much more engaged. And to that extent, I totally uh, uh, take into account what uh, Rick and uh, George were saying. We used to have a situation in which the voice of the United States in reminding countries reneging from their democratic practices helped a lot precisely because uh, there was a certain partnership in which uh, some of these countries were willing to listen to a, 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 a superpower like the, the United States. But what, that has, what we have seen in the past uh, four to five years is that that has completely disappeared. And we now have a situation in which, in many of the conflicts we are talking about, there is a form of rivalry about who is doing what, rather than a collective effort to hold people to account to principles and values that makes it possible for inclusion, that makes it possible for the type of political environment in which everybody has a stake and are prepared to invest in. And now we have coming back in very forceful ways, the strong people, the strong men taking over. Now today, the president of Chad has just been buried. He's been in office for 30 years. It's amazing that he has been one of the leaders who simply took away the constitution and he's, he was going to be sworn in for the sixth, uh, sixth term in office. But I want to be very open and frank here. The president of France is in charge, and everybody is praising the strong man for having held Chad 
for 30 years. But there is no sustainability there. What we are saying indirectly is that his son, as long as he's strong, can be there for another 30 years. So we need to have the strong voices like the United States in global leadership, reminding countries that we are not trying to dictate to you how you should live your lives. But what we are simply saying is, if you want stability and if you want peace, let's look at the structural dimensions of the conflict and not look at just how we window dress what might have happened to create a violent change of power and to that extent, once we can manage that and bring stability, life then continues as normal, only for a recurrence to happen and we find ourselves back there. I'm saying this because I am very concerned that in all the conflicts we've talked about, and I have cited the examples of Africa better, I'll put Yemen in the same category, Syria. What is the impact? It is the suffering of civilians overwhelmingly and by majority women and children. So we cannot engage in policy decisions that pretend that we don't see suffering. And as long as we are able to manage political stability, then we think life can go on. I will make this emphasis as what needs to change. We need to have, yes, local efforts, but supported by the strong voices that shape global governance right from the Security Council and into our regional organizations. And secondly, to conclude, whilst doing this to strengthen regional organizations, I don't want to cite ECOWAS, I don't want to be seen as praising a regional organization that I have been part of and have contributed to. But at least ECOWAS is more proactive in prevention. And yet all of you in the field who have appreciated the role of uh, the role of ECOWAS are also beginning to be concerned that in that same region we are seeing a reversal of the progress that was made. And I gave the examples of Guinea. In Guinea alone, not less than 200 people were killed before the elections, during the elections, and after the elections. Life has continued. The president is in for the third term. It's the same in Cote d'Ivoire, where the question of identity brought a devastating civil war. So the regional organizations must be strengthened to go back to their values and provide leadership. Now, if we have leadership coming from the regions, it is possible then to have the Security Council and powerful governments coming along and supporting that effort. But when we don't have regional leadership, then countries like the United States would be careful not to be seen to be meddling in the politics or policies of regions. And I think we need to align all these and to conclude, therefore, civil society, women groups, all of us probably need to have a direction of policy advocacy that speak to these issues in order to influence governments and policy making at both international, regional, and national levels. Thank you so much, Christine. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. Thank you. What a lot to think about. Um, now, are you even adding another layer to that? Uh, Rick, what are, what are your thoughts on this question? Well, thanks. Well, I'd like, to, I'd like to build on what Emmanuel said and really emphasize sort of the expanding of networks and the circles um, and being totally intentional about it. Obviously, it starts with, with women and young people. They're, they tend to be the two groups that are left out of virtually every uh, political policy, peacemaking, peace building process, and yet they are an overwhelming majority in every country, in particular in the countries that we're working in where, where they are young countries over, uh, overall, where the, the, half the population is under 50. So if you take women and people under 25, uh, I should have said under 25, um, they uh, you're going to be talking about huge majorities. But what I'd like to do is think about two ways of getting at, uh, at sort of how do, you exp how do we expand our circles in a time where access and mobility is maybe limited as it has been for the last year and a half, um, or at least the last year in, mu in much of the world. And I, I'd like to say, uh, this is a bit out of style, but I'd like to say something positive about technology here. <laughs> it's... Uh, uh, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of promise. And I just would give one example. We were trying to, when I was a CSO, we were trying to recruit somebody who, who we thought could, uh, could 
hit the ground running in the DRC in the Congo. And so we started, and rather than looking, doing the usual State Department search, which would, which would look something like, are there any retired ambassadors or generals hanging around, uh, even if they don't know anything about the Congo, um, we decided to use LinkedIn. And so we went, we put in a few, uh, a few categories like language and a couple of things, and we ended up with, I think, a million people. But within 15 minutes, we had thinned the category so we actually had six people who had on-the-ground experience, language, everything else you could possibly want. And it so turned out that two of those six people knew Andy Loomis in the very next office. So we could just go over to talk to Andy Loomis and say, Andy, about these two people that we just identified, what do you know? Are they, are they people we want to pursue? I'm not sure we got the answer we wanted from that, but we got a lot farther than we would have through any other system that we might have. So technology obviously has lots of advantages. We know them, but people are damning it way too readily right now because we're because it's being misused. Um, secondly, communicating tirelessly uh, and in a candid way. And that and I I think about traditional media here. Now we couldn't get into Syria, so what did we do? We Skyped people in Syria. That would be a more modern way of doing it. At one point in my, teaching one of my courses at Princeton, you know, I think you'll love this story. I got a call from the Office of Transition Initiative saying that somebody was using my name and they thought it was a Russian spy because they had called seven, this person had called 17 opposition leaders in various towns and they had gotten together and wondered who this was using my name. So I, so I had no idea what they were talking about. And then I realized, I had given one of my students some people to contact in. So I, so I said her name, was that the name that was being used? It turned out it was my student. The, just doing a piece of research on what was going on in the opposition towns a year and a half or two years after uh, I had stopped being involved there, she discovered that around the Friday prayer days, there were still many peaceful protests, even in Assad occupied cities. I had not read that in any other any other place. And she was able to come up with it because she was actually talking to people using the technology. But more conventional media, we realized that the internet connect connectivity in Syria was only 20%. But satellite dishes were everywhere. And guess what people were watching in Syria, even during the war, they were watching soap operas from neighbor neighboring country networks. So what we tried to do is do a little bit of advertising in those market in, in those stations to drive people to internet sites that were run by the Syrian opposition. Now that was that could all be done in, in an overt way. It didn't have to be an American secret. We were trying to promote the Syrian opposition, which was central to our uh, efforts there, since we weren't going to take the, the, the next dramatic step. So um, I think basically. Um, if you're if you focus on expanding the circle, uh, being inclusive, being open, uh, knowing that we need more players, the peace building field is grotesquely underdeveloped still. So we can always welcome new members. Um, then I think that you're you're on a, on, on a good path, and, and there are lots of uh, lots of vehicles to take you down that road. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. George? Well, again, I had the great advantage of following my two colleagues who've covered such good principles and ground. And, you know, I'll say that uh, I have, a, I have a, a worry and a learned lesson uh, coming out of this time period. Uh, the worry is that the declaration, however well-intentioned and hopeful our good new president Joe Biden would be in saying America's back, um, I combine that with all my neighbors uh, who say, and we're getting back to normal. Uh, I don't want the normal prior to the pandemic in terms of the way we think about peace building and prevention and these other kinds of things. We should derive learned lessons from the experiences we've had of having more and more meetings like this and more and more meetings transnationally. Uh, we ran a uh, program on increasing the normative and, and Catholic thinking about dealing with nuclear war from the 75th anniversary, first week in August, just through next week, 
with a combined student group of United States, Korean, Japanese students, and then students who joined us from other corners of the world. What we did is we started it at eight or nine o'clock at night, East Coast time, so that the folks on the far East Asia could join us in their mornings. And that combination of students, I'm starting to think about, well, why can't we run courses like that, where we really have this transnational inclusiveness, uh, especially because as uh, often happens in our peace courses about these concerns, 80% of the student participants were women, because uh, they care more about this, it seems, than most other folks. Um, also the case that I, I worry about the new normal and with all correct understanding of the role the US must play normatively, that we be careful about the stylistics and the substance of that. Um, like it or not, we're caught again in a colonial kind of enterprise in the way that vaccines are being uh, clearly available to all in the Western world, uh, in Europe, the United States, et cetera, but less and less so to Latin America, Africa, and South Asia. And, and how we respond to that situation is gonna be one of the first indicators to me for how we're adjusting to a new normal with the combination of our yes being back but also learning the lesson of what it means to be victims of not enemies, but of pandemics and forces we can't control. And lastly, again, as you're, uh, you, you called me the social scientist in the group, uh, or at least the, the person in the classroom who pretends to be, um, I, there's no excuse for those of us in higher education anymore for not being increasingly transnational about what we do because the learning from Zoom now opens up a world of guest speakers, all of whom are usually of goodwill and you don't pay prestigious honorarium to, but have a greater impact on your students than, than you probably do if you're an American-based social science. So that's one thing that I take away that, that I hope moves towards uh, uh, building a, a better understanding of the local and the global in peace building. Thank you so much to each of the three of you for indulging my questions. And now it's time to open this up to the wider group. Uh, I've been trying to catch up on the chat because it's really lively today, which is one of my favorite things. Um, Milt Laurenstein, I believe that you had asked a question about post-violence in Kenya. And I see that several of our participants have been dialoguing with that. Um, would you like to address that question or bring that conversation into our wider group today? Sure. I, <laughs> uh, Emmanuel uh, Bombande uh, responded that more uh, collaborative um, efforts uh, are, are needed. And I certainly agree with that. And then I <laughs> asked, who's going to um, initiate uh, widespread collaboration? And are international organizations likely to be willing to collaborate under local leadership? Um, and I'd certainly be very interested in Emmanuel's response or that from anyone else. Sure. Uh, you want me to go ahead? Yes, please jump in. Yes. Yeah, it, it, uh, so let me connect with uh, Professor Lopez when he talked about the the new, the not the not the normal before the pandemic, but the new normal about transnational engagements. What what you often realize, uh, Milt, is that in countries, the political will, beginning with political actors, to be willing to accept these forms of collaboration is critical. And so actors are willing to work together, and yet we need the entry through the political, so to speak, entry point. And when those entry points are blocked for various reasons, it becomes frustrating. So what we need to do is, how do we build our transnational linkages to bring the type of, I wouldn't want to use the word pressure, but to bring the type of clarity that makes it possible for governments to understand that this is in your interest and to open the doors, therefore, to support those uh, subnational and local initiatives 
if we now want to go forward. So that when we talk about good governance and when we talk about respect for human rights and democracy, government should not be seen as collaborating to undermine them, but rather to say, this is the best way you fight extremism. This is the best way you fight terrorism. And so it's more about how we are able to pass through those hurdles in order to effectively allow the collaboration to happen. But obviously, uh, working with local partners, constantly ensuring that local uh, ownership is key, then can uh, make the difference. Uh, could, I, could I jump in uh, on this, Christina? Hi, can you okay? all hear me? Yeah, is it, okay, is it okay if I jump in on this? Absolutely. Um, you know, I think that one of the weaknesses that we've had in a lot of these uh, peace making processes is that we've we've tried to kind of isolate and segment uh, populations. Um, and I, I don't know if in the last I, something that I had lost track of but been reading as we as uh, President Biden has introduced a, a change in policy and uh, or a, a going ahead in Afghanistan of removing U.S. troops. There was, in one of the articles I read, uh, spoke about the an early opportunity we had to do some peace building work with the Taliban. But we thought we we're gonna crush them, uh, we're gonna wipe them out, and then we'll never have to see them again. And, uh, and, and they were deeply unpopular at that time. So they were not in a strong position, either geographically or in any other way, but we had the opportunity to include them. I would say the same thing uh, with with what we did in Iraq and wiping out, sort of saying that anybody who had any association with the prior regime did not have any social standing. That was a mistake, and I think it helped to feed into the ISIS, uh, the eventual development of ISIS, at least their ability to get uh, arms that we never recovered. Um, so we can be, we've got, a, we, we, we have an opportunity early on to be conveners, to be, to be, to, to uh, expand the circle. But again, it's gotta be intentional and it, and, and it shouldn't be exclusive of parties we don't like. I mean, it's just, you know, the, the problem about these places is it's a lot of not very lovable people that have been, have been at play. And you, that's what peace building is, is all about. You're, you're actually talking to people you don't necessarily love. Well said, <laughs> well said, Rick. Uh, so we had a question from Cinda who just had to jump off, but she was asking about the role of women, peace and security agenda in moving us towards peace. So um, planting that in the back of your mind, I'd also like to turn to our next person asking a question, which I believe is you, Connor. Um, Connor, are you able to address your question directly today? You're muted. Excellent. I had double muted just in case. Now I'm safe. Um, I don't think there's more than what I said in the text. Um, I think that one of the themes that I've heard is the importance of kind of personal learning in y'all's experiences and the degree to which you have developed kind of strategies that, that show how to do your work better. What I'm curious about, because this has been a theme that I've heard does not exist and would love your take on it, is to the degree that there is institutional learning in the training and support for mediators and negotiators. Do you think that there are sufficient systems in place to ensure collective learning and lessons drawn from evidence, like, like, your, like your work, George, um, and getting those systemically in front of negotiators, or is it still kind of ad hoc, personal, idiosyncratic? And if it is that, what do you think is needed to get to that systemized learning? Wow, um, let me jump in a bit, uh, and it it reflects, uh, or let me let me suggest that uh, Margarita's question that she's just put into everyone uh, uh, gets gets very close to that too. So if I combine them, I I think, and and maybe this is self serving for those of us who spent most of our time in universities, I think that in order to tackle these problems, um, we've got to have a constant flow of inclusion from local peace building circles to a knowledge base that can be worked on in think tanks and universities and the connection of both of those two to the policy making circles. And um, I take some, some real strength from the work that places like Peace Direct and Alliance for Peace Building 
and other places based in this country and others have uh, done with, with, with creating that, if you will, power triangle of local peace building, uh, growth of knowledge in the US and elsewhere and the policy making circles that we learn not only what works locally, and I, I put a linkage to the good news study there that they've done about what works locally with um, uh, also the connections to larger international organizations, whether it be the United Nations or it will be the NGO uh, groups like Oxfam and, and others that play a role in this kind of mitigation of violence. I think the best way to not get stale at or focus on the negative piece that Margarita mentioned is to be able to have that constant flow dynamic and to have some of the tough meetings you have to have between uh, folks who are working in the field and the government people who are trying to forge uh, policy. Uh, Nekla raised a question about, you know, what are we doing about prevention and do you have any hope on that? Well, the example I was able to look at for the last couple of years has been the progress in the Global Fragility Act in the United States Congress and moving forward with that really coming from the momentum brought to it by uh, many of the NGOs that, that work in the field and, and some of the better ones in the US that have been in tough places in Africa and Asia to say, look, this is how we deliver services and your congressional US focused way of every two years we'll, we'll develop new appropriations for group. We need a sustained concentration committed to areas regardless of the way it works out in week two, uh, in year two, three, or four. And so the 10-year preventative approach of the GFA, I think, is one of our strongest foots forward into the modern world of making that triangle work. You know, Can I also just, but, oh, go ahead, Rick. I was just going to, I, I totally agree with everything George said. I think the Academy has really come a heck of a long way. I mean, there are several hundred now programs, obviously, the Carter School here is a great example. Uh, George's uh, work at at uh, Notre Dame, and but uh, so so that's a huge advancement. The SDG 16, as he mentioned, the Global Fertility Act. Those are they, these are all good signs, but it's still a deeply under resourced area. It's still a weak lean. Uh, in the in in the system, um, despite the generosity of people like Milt and and uh, the Cro and Joan Croc and others, so I th and I would just give one example at the State Department. I will know that CSO is has really is really playing the role it should play when a crisis unfolds. Let's say in in the, the Tigray area of Ethiopia. Ethiopia. And the Secretary of State uh, makes sure that at that very first meeting that she has or he has with, with uh, the staff, uh, the leading staff includes the Assistant Secretary for CSO as well as the Assistant Secretary for Africa. Because the Assistant Secretary for Africa may never have had this kind of a conflict before, but if the Assistant Secretary of CSO isn't familiar with it, then it's probably the wrong person in the job. So. And, and, and you really want perspective. I mean, you've really got that. There's, the, nobody has the answer to these places. You want a fulsome conversation. So it's, 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 it's grown. There's an awareness. There's a lot of young talent ready to go. It's quite terrific in that regard, the commitment. And by the way, people really want to work in places like CSO, but it is not yet a great place to get a promotion if you are a career officer. Uh, not because we 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 uh, poison people when they're there, but because it's not it's it's because it's not seen as part of the normal routine. So these are all the cultural changes, but it starts with the Secretary of State saying, "I'm not going. I'm not talking about a conflict or a potential conflict or preventing a conflict unless CSO or an OTI and some of the other tools are are actively involved." I also just wanted to give a quick note to the person who just asked a question, Connor, because Connor has been part of an over a year long initiative with our colleague Jessica baumgartner Zuzik at the Alliance for Peace Building to actually ask all of us, many of us on this call, as well as from across the field, what the perceptions of our evidence base for peace building and peacemaking has been. And so I wanted to give a quick plug that they released their, re their report on all those findings this week, and that we're going to host them on May 12th for a follow up on that. 
So I invite a lot of this group back. Maybe we can keep some of these conversations going in that forum. Um, I did also, I love when I start seeing our audience ask similar questions, but they're getting at slightly different things. I'm noting that next, Caleb, it's great to have you on the call with us today. That um, You've asked a question about positive peace. So has Margarita. So I wonder if the two of you, Caleb and Margarita, could address the specific aspect that you're questioning there. Caleb and Margarita, are you with us? Um, yes. Um, thank you. Thank you, Christina. Sorry. Um, uh, so I think, thank you for the, uh, this wonderful discussion actually is very stimulating and interesting and helps to reflect on a lot of things that I've been doing throughout the years. And um, my, I guess my question here was um, uh, to follow up uh, about what was said uh, in terms of how we transition or how can we create incentives for the international community to remain engaged and sustainably and meaningfully engaged after there is some resemblance of negative peace. I think uh, what I have seen, at least in the South Caucasus where uh, I've been working, um, that once their bullets are no longer flying, um, things are more or less okay, and there is a decrease in the levels of violence, um, gradually uh, there is less and less interest uh, and engagement, and I want to say meaningful engagement uh, by the international community when it comes to building more sustainable or more positive peace and transforming and uh, institutions and creating uh, structures for uh, for peace building that are sustainable that would surpass and kind of uh, uh, have a longer lifespan than a certain regime administration and will withstand uh, changes uh, changes in the environment. So. I guess that that's my first question. How can we uh, as academics, as practitioners, as people who advise or in some ways are engaged in a policy decisions, keep um, or uh, so create structures that would support more prolonged engagement that is beyond um, negative peace? Um, and I'll just, given the time and interest, I'll just stop there. Um, and I have a couple more comments and questions, but we can come back to that later. Thank you, Margarita. Caleb, are you able to connect with us today and ask um, a somewhat similar question, but about positive peace in the Kenyan context? I see you on the line. Are you able to ask your question now? Yes. Hello. Hello. Hi, thank you. Yes, yeah, uh, my question was regarding the, the question on MILT, the, the comment rather that he had made around the Kenyan situation, the Kenyan case following the 2007-2008 uh, post-election violence. And uh, he had, I, I was acknowledging the role played by the local groups and international groupings under the civil society umbrella. But my argument was that much of that, as far as it went towards the stopping of violence, especially in feeding the Kofi Annan um, dialogues or um, uh, that was happening, much of it just stopped the, the violence. But we had yet, even up to date, to achieve a positive peace in Kenya. So how do we walk towards positive Positive peace, or how can these groupings go beyond uh, stopping violence or the negative peace to achieve uh, positive peace? Thank you. Thank you both to Caleb and Margarita. And I can kind of link that back to Cinda, who's no longer on the line with us, but Cinda's question about women, peace, and security, because there, is, there are aspects of building that positive peace that female inclusion is going to be linked to. Do any of our panelists have a comment on these themes that are being raised? I can, I can, I can give a quick, uh, uh, yeah, if, if, if you may allow, uh, let, let me take the first question very quickly to say that I, I think we should begin to look at peace processes in which when we arrive at an outcome that we otherwise describe as an agreement, that actually becomes the start off point of building the peace rather than working with an agreement as the preoccupation. And once an agreement is signed, everybody then begins to exit and to, to, to celebrate what may, may look like 
an achievement. And we've seen that it has not worked in South Sudan. It has not worked in, 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 in many places. So how do we shift to say that all efforts towards an agreement is only a first phase and real peace processes begin once there's an outcome because it's about the implementation of those outcomes. That's point number one. A button made, a Rick made a comment about how some nations, and we, 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 we don't appreciate that enough, are actually young nations. Most African countries are just 60 years, 65 years. And so institutions have not even fully developed. And on top of all that are these complexities and minerals of conflicts. So in the example of Kenya, whereas there were good efforts, what for me was remarkable was the space for the voices of citizens. And what Kenyans must do is never allow those voices to be taken away by the politics. And that if the citizens can continue to insist as they did in the post-election violence, they will be able to hold that country together and deepen democratic practice. But if citizens renege, because the local citizens' contribution that led up to the Kofi Annan mediation effort, driven a lot by active community engagement, has somewhat taken a downturn. Citizens must rediscover themselves and not allow the politics to take away those voices and drive the process. And quickly, what I can say about women, peace, and security is we must make it fully integral to the peace process, precisely because we are not talking about women in terms of numbers, but the uniqueness of women's participation from quality, from the concern for human suffering, and for the type of commitments that they bring into peace processes. I have seen that the more you are at the subnational level, and I made that comment, the more you can feel the full effect. And yet the more you go to the track one dialogue at political and policy engagement, the less you begin to see women participation. So one thing is women must be leaders in politics in order that they contribute more to the policy making. And for many countries, that is not yet happening. So we must have mechanisms that are deliberate in how women can be leaders. My former boss I worked with as sec, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs is now the head of the UN in the African Union. And I told her, you could never have been there if you were not a foreign minister. So how many women will be foreign ministers in order to occupy the positions of envoys and heads of institutions? I think that is very critical. And the women networks, therefore, should be prepared to deploy and support the women efforts within countries going through violence. Beyond the advocacy, they must be seen on the ground also in the practice in support of women networks and women groups. This is my quick take on these. Thank you. We have so many questions coming in. We have a question from someone who's no longer with us, but it was, can the panelists share their insight into prevention, which still remains under supported? I'm going to fold that into Neil, you are up next. Um, you've written a question into the chat. Want to unmute yourself and address it directly? Uh, thank you, Christina. Great, great panel. And I just wanted to take advantage of the uh, three disruptors there to focus in on what experiments um, do you think we should be running? I, I'm of a mind uh, now with the benefit of uh, being away from government that um, until we abandon our business model, we're going to be highly constrained to move in the direction that uh, local peace building that requires to get at some of these trust relationships, at the creativity, and to really empower. And I guess I really liked Emmanuel's uh, among many nuggets that I'm taking away. The last one you know, suggests an experiment to me, which is um, a focused attention as women peace builders um, uh, and prioritize that in some of these interventions. But I'd like to ask the panel, what experiments do you think, given the toolkit we have that you'd like to see or have seen that been, have been particularly um, responsive to changing the role of internationals and putting local actors at the, either the national, but also we've had a lot of dialogue about the subnational level today that you think hold the most promise. And thank you for a great panel. I, 
I'm happy to jump in. I hope Rick is too, and Emmanuel. Uh, I'll go back to what, one of the things I said before, Neil, and, and also to Cindy's uh, question, and that is, I think the approach of GFA and, and the emphasis on prevention, which emerged from studies of stabilization and other things, I think that's, that's as best foot forward as I've seen uh, for a whole of government approach if we stayed within a traditional government framework. Um, I, I admit I'm, I'm a little more than a little disappointed that uh, the quite good Secretary General we've had for the UN, who made it one of his platforms to include more women in various levels and has done that, didn't move one step historically more ahead and say, rather than stand up for another five-year term as Secretary General, it's time for me to leave and to have women's leadership at the UN. That would have been not only symbolic, but real. And I think policy people at the higher levels need to think more about those, those real dimensions in the spirit that Emmanuel shared with us about that story. Um, lastly, I guess um, the, every reform is an experiment, is one of the methodological uh, dynamics we teach in, in grad school to people who become policymakers. Uh, I'm hoping we can get more alliance between the rich entrepreneurial class, however they may have made their money, and their attachment to things that they say they many of them deeply value, and that is real structural change. You know what the racial revolution is coming to in the United States is a recognition of real structural change. So we've had this great debate in, in some of the chat between negative peace and positive peace. What Galtung meant originally was that physical violence isn't the only violence. Structural violence is what's got to be cured, and and it's positive peace when you get to the structures. And I feel hopeful uh, that there's ways in which, whether those structures are racial, ethnic, or misogynistic, we can, we can find ways to tackle them by, by new alliances of money and creativity that we have yet to invent. Yeah, I mean, I certainly agree with what everything that Emmanuel and George said. I would just, I would just add that what, what do I see as the greatest shortcomings right now? I think creativity is one of them. So we have a we have a space that because it's an elite field, the number of people who sort of constantly get stuck around a core of ideas rather than really just constantly challenging uh, the, the, the space is, is uh, I think can be stultified. And so to be, you've got to create opportunities in places like the State Department for a conversation where people say, can start a conversation by saying, this isn't my lane or this may be a crazy idea. Great, I'm gonna love that because that means that we might actually be getting something outside of the normal. And I know when I got back to the, when I was the ambassador to the UN, that the other countries were thrilled to have the United States back after the Iraq war and whatnot. But then they expected us to actually have some ideas to do something uh, and, and not, not just to be back. And that, so we got the same moment right now. I do think that the initiatives of the Biden administration are really rather are very bold, in particular in the climate space. And that's a good start. I say flexible funding would be another one. You know, if you started, if you, we, when I went to work in Kenya on election violence, five years, three, four, five years after the terrible 2007-8 election, um, the, the United States is spending 850 million public dollars there. I don't know how many, what our private expenditures were. 800 million of that was to fight AIDS. Nothing wrong with fighting AIDS, but every single Kenyan that we spoke to said their biggest worry was that the election was going to turn into a violent uh, event. And many, many, many more people would get killed in, in a short period of time than would die through, from a terrible, terrible plague such as AIDS. So, being, having a flexible funding is really important. And then I think how we how quickly we move as, a, as, as any institution, the UN is slow. AID was always proud because we were faster than the World Bank. Uh, that meant that instead of, instead of taking four years to develop an idea, it only took us two years. Uh, well, in two years in most of these places, you're pretty much on your 14th government. Uh, so you may have missed an opportunity. So, uh, but, but so the assistance and acquisition model should not be, and our, and our organizational model should not be the Department of Defense or the Navy. It should be something that actually relates to the world that we're operating in, which, uh, which is, uh, that is not the tradition of our assistance and acquisition 
or even our promotional models in, in the bureaucracies. And by the way, the UN's bureaucracy just looks like ours, but with a lot more languages. No, this is fantastic. Not much to add, but to maybe re-echo the flexible funding. If, if we take the peace building fund, for example, at the level of the United Nations, how can we bring more flexibility into it? Uh, I took a cue and I know the United States has been supporting that because there was no leadership at national level in Brazil to respond to COVID-19, there's an effort now directly to support mayors. Now, can you imagine in the same way, for example, in the Rift Valley of Kenya, flexible funding for communities there to be talking among themselves about their coexistence and how they, they should not be drawn into violence and politics. If we can have that type of flexible funding uh, with creativity, we can probably begin to do a lot. And we could even begin to change the thinking of national politics and national leaders to listen more to what is coming from communities. I just wanted to add that. Could I add just one little story? So there's nothing like role playing that sometimes gets people out of their, their habits. And I just remember when I was at CSS, we did a exercise on Pakistan, but we had the State Department uh, the, the senior woman from the State Department, she played a U.S. senator in the morning, and she was devastating and so effective in her, in her questioning and her commenting. In the afternoon, she went back to being a State Department uh, official, and it was very disappointing, uh, her contributions. <laughs> so, so give people the opportunity to get out of themselves so they don't, they're not there playing the institutional role or, or acting on behalf of some, some cause already. Mm -hmm. This has been a fascinating panel. It's now my very challenging job to try and pull a few of the themes that I think we've discussed today, although I cannot really do this conversation justice. I've heard a few things and a few questions from the audience about this theme of prevention. I think that's tied into this flexible funding question. Um, are we fully able to prevent something if it doesn't have the kind of prestige that we've also talked about? How do we change the incentive structures, not only for by doing preventive work, but also the incentive structures for allowing international actors to promote, as Rick said, to rise within the system of allowing um, women to promote, as Emmanuel said, and um, changing incentive structures, not only across the sort of policy space that we've talked about today, but, but within academic research, within giving, um, within local peace building, and the, some of the reporting requirements that are onerous and that prevent them from fully engaging in ways that they've communicated to me. Um, I think that we've also discussed today that, um, that just because there's a lot of commitment doesn't mean that the challenges are any easier and that we are in fact expecting more challenges as well as some opportunities going back again to what Rick has said about technology. We are just now hitting time so it is um, my, my sadness to end the panel, but also my pleasure to once again thank very much Ambassador Rick Barton, Mr. Emmanuel Bombande, and Dr. George Lopez for so generously giving of your time, for going behind the scenes with us and talking about the motivations that have led you to spend your careers um, immersed in the details of these issues. And as always, to say a big and very warm thank you to the group that gathers that enriches our conversation in ways that um, just me as a talking head could never do. Thank you so much. Um, with this, I'll close our session for today, inviting everyone to join us once again on May 12th for a follow-up. And um, thank you to all for joining us. Thank you all. Great to be with you. Thank you so much.